Dear Scott Cawthon, Hi! It's me, Austin! And it is time for my biggest challenge yet. Can I do a video on a game that I haven't played yet, that isn't even out yet, based on no gameplay footage because it does not exist? And, hell, just to make it even extra challenging, can we turn one single image from the promotional press package into an entire video? Can we? Can we do it? You bet your donkey we can. <laughs> The topic I want to cover today is actually really cool, and the main goal going through all of this is to make sure that I don't say anything that offends my favorite Persian electrical engineer on this website, Electroboom. So no, it's not the voltage that kills, but the current in this video. If I can get from right now all the way to the very end without saying anything super wrong about electrical engineering, I am going to consider that a solid win. And it all boils down to this one picture from the press pack package for the Five Nights at Freddy's augmented reality game that's coming out, uh, soon? Ish? Anyway, the game, officially called Five Nights at Freddy's AR Special Delivery, which is apparently trying to compete with anime for convoluted titles, will basically let you play Five Nights at Freddy's in the real world with your phone, so you can live in permanent fear by associating murderous animatronics with your real, actual house. The one that you sleep in. So that's fun! The game, like all augmented reality games, is played with your phone as the main interface with the rest of the world, and and as a result, the designers of FNAF ARSD made the game reflect this by making it so all the buttons and stuff you press in-game are smartphone related. This also allows them to seamlessly integrate one of the normally baffling core game contrivances into the FNAF series into the game, the limited battery power. This brings us back to the picture from before. This one, a picture that shows us a returning mechanic from Sister Location, where you use electric shocks to temporarily disable the evil possessed robots that are trying to kill you. An electric shock coming from your cell phone, leaping several feet into a robot with enough power to disable them. Oh boy. So, shocking someone with your cell phone. This is not an easy numbers in, numbers out question to answer because there are a lot of moving parts to consider. We have some problems to overcome, but in the shortest, simplest terms, is it possible to use your cell phone to produce giant electrical arcs? I... Maybe. <laughs> Let's try and figure it out. The first major problem is the robot itself. So the convention in FNAF, starting with sister location, is that electricity temporarily disables animatronics. This is not a permanent state. This is, unfortunately, not how electronics work. If you apply enough electricity to an electronic device to render it non-functional, that is, generally speaking, a permanent state. You have killed it. Good job. This is because if you apply really high current to devices that exceed its rating, it will cause some component to permanently fail by burning out because, hey, electricity is a force caused by the moving of electrons, and its main byproduct is heat. A lot of electronics are protected by what's called a fuse, which is a point through which all electricity has to flow before reaching delicate components. If too much electricity flows through a fuse, the metal will melt and disconnect, breaking off the flow of electricity. That means that some devices need to be repaired by resoldering or plugging in a new fuse, but hey, at least it didn't fry any of the important parts. Unfortunately, in the case of Five Nights at Freddy's, this does not work, because if the animatronics turn themselves back on, that means that they clearly don't have a fuse, since when a fuse dies, it dies. Your house actually has very similar technology in it. It's your circuit breaker box. When too much electricity flows through a breaker, it heats up a deflected piece of metal, which activates a switch that just disables the flow of electricity to a specific area of your house. The problem here is that breakers still need manual reactivation, meaning that once you disable a FNAF robot, it's turned off until some idiot turns it back on. Or at least that's what I thought, until I discovered auto-resetting circuit breakers. They work the exact same way as a normal switch breaker, but as a metal cools off after overheating, it will deflect back into place, reconnecting the power. 
BAM! Got him! The lowest rated automatically resetting breaker I could find was rated to switch off when 12 volts and 10 amps flow through it at a minimum of 4.5 seconds and a max of 28 seconds. We want the most temperamental breaker we can find because that's going to make it way more likely that our phone battery is going to realistically be able to work. The higher the power requirements, the less likely we're going to be able to bend the laws of the universe to make this make sense. Now the electricity. Phone batteries are awesome all different, but most of them are under 4,000 milliamp hours and rated for 3.85 volts. This gives the typical phone battery a total energy storage of 51,282 joules, which we can figure out by taking the milliamp hours and multiplying them by 3,600 to get the total charge and then multiply that by the voltage, which for my phone, a Pixel XL, which has seen better days. Look, I, I, I let my kid walk off with it and when they came back, it looked like this. Life lesson, do not let your toddler play with your phone. But it still works fine. Look, see? <laughs> okay, I'll get a new phone. Anyway, my phone has 3,700 milliamp hours and a voltage of 3.85 volts, giving it a total potential energy of 51,282 joules. Bam! We can mostly ignore this for now, but it will be important later. Now, electrical arcs. Oh boy, electrical arcs, these are really tricky. Electricity does not want to arc across open air. There's usually tons of easier things to jump to before leaping through the air, which at distances in this picture are what? Like one to three feet? That gives air a resistance of anywhere from 115-ish billion giga ohms to 375 billion giga ohms. In order to get electricity to arc these distances, you need really, really high voltages. Like, absurdly high. Technically, and this is technically, the voltage requirements to arc through a given gas are governed by Paschen's law, which is this ugly monster that I simply could not get to behave at all. I suspect it's this prime symbol over here that's giving me trouble. <laughs> Thankfully, within these parameters, the voltages required for arcing electricity are pretty well known and mostly kinda linear. In Earth's atmosphere, at standard conditions, electricity requires 3 million volts per meter in order to arc. So for our phone zapper, we're looking at anything from 915,000 volts to 3 million volts. That is a lot to expect from a tiny battery rated for 3.85 volts. Now, there are ways to boost voltage while sacrificing your current, though. Unfortunately, all the best ways to do this seem to be using alternating current or AC for like a thousand different reasons that I don't want to get into because I will say something wrong and mess it up. Chemical batteries, meanwhile, provide DC or direct current, and it's here where I would love to cut away to an ACDC song, and if I did that, Columbia Records would be like, and it's here where I'd love to take all of your money! So, here's a knockoff version instead. I did vacillate on whether or not using a power inverter to turn the DC into AC, or whether to use what's called a DC step-up boost converter would be the best way to go, but then, looking at it further, I realized that this wasn't even close to my biggest problem. The shortcomings of AC to DC is irrelevant when you compare it to the actual biggest problem. How do you store all these volts from such a low power source? Because it turns out you can't build a single capacitor capable of storing 3 million volts because, like I said before, Air is a great insulator, better than most others. So voltages that are high enough to arc through the air are probably gonna arc through any other material you make the capacitor out of. A capacitor is a pretty simple device that's actually really similar to a chemical battery, but it holds electrons differently. Specifically, it's able to hold high voltages and release them much faster than a typical chemical battery. See, a chemical battery, which is like really almost like every single battery you use in everyday life, is a device that stores energy using, well, chemicals. In the case of lithium ion batteries, like your cell phone has, one side of the battery has lithium cobalt oxide and the other side has graphite and they're separated by an electrolyte. When you charge the battery, the electrons are attracted to this side and flow through the power source and then deposited on the graphite. The lithium ions are then attracted through the electrolyte to the other side. Then when you power something, this whole process works in reverse. Capacitors work in a very similar way by having two conductive metals side by side separated by an insulator. Electrons are free to build up 
on one side and push the electrons out of the other side. One side becomes negatively charged and the other positively charged. And you can release all this energy at once. Bam! The trade-off with capacitors is that they can hold less total energy than a battery and they can hold it for only a kind of short period of time. And there are practical limitations to how much voltage a single capacitor can hold. Okay, so what are our problems? Just to reiterate, in order to zap an animatronic, we have to up our 3.85 volt battery voltage up to 3 million volts somehow. We also have to store this energy in order to release it all at once. The only thing working in our favor is that once the arc has been established, the air it's passing through becomes ionized, which allows electricity to flow much more easily through it, meaning 3 million volts is a temporary requirement. The highest step-up converter I could find for DC was 300 volts. That is not ideal, because capacitors can only store charge at the peak voltage they're provided with. But do not fear, because capacitors that are wired in series together add their voltages together. Meaning, we only need a minimum of 3,000-ish capacitors and a maximum of 10,000. Since we don't actually need a ton of power output, we can use relatively weak ones, I, I think. Don't judge me, my king! Anyway, Mouser lets us buy capacitors in bulk for a discount so we can spend, uh, only $30,000 to $97,000 on capacitors weighing almost 19 kilograms or over 40 pounds! Now, once we've established our first arc, essentially ionizing the air, all we have to do is deliver a comparatively tame 20 amps at 12 volts over our ionized wire made of oxygen and nitrogen over 4.5 to 28 seconds. With the aid of capacitors and step-ups, can our 51,282 joule battery handle this. Yes, with some limitations. Lithium ion batteries can only really draw about two and a half amps of current tops without risking melting the wires connected to them. This, along with volts, is our bottleneck because if you fry the connectors, you're never gonna be able to use your phone or its battery ever again. The max wattage of our battery, which is joules per second or amps times volts, is 9.625 watts. And 9.625 joules per second and our required joules between 1080 and 6720 this means it would take anywhere from 112 seconds to just shy of 12 minutes to charge our capacitors and an average of 27 shocks per fully charged battery that's kind of impressive but of course the implications if you were to build such a device are utterly terrifying sure maybe you could shock an animatronic maybe but you know what's way closer than an animatronic you! The current is just as likely to short to you, or the phone chassis, delivering, depending upon where it hits, something as small as 12 milliamps, which would give you a really nasty shock, like, youch, one of the worst ones you've ever felt in your life, but that's the best case scenario, because if conditions are just right, they can deliver up to 120 milliamps to your body, through your heart, which is instant, irreversible death. Also, that's all ignoring the Ghostbusters backpack you need to wear of full electrical equipment and capacitors and boosters in order to get the voltage high enough. I mean, honestly, even if you were to use a Tesla coil, usually Teslas that produce these voltages are huge. So either way, you're looking at a big, expensive backpack. And also, the implications of this is that the electric shocks are not an improvised weapon because the animatronics are installed with auto-resetting circuit breakers. They are designed with this in mind. So you have a thousands of dollars device that exists all in order to temporarily disable a murderous robot for a few minutes. Wonderful! Hey, you know a much cheaper way to turn electricity created from a lithium ion? I am battery into a dead animatronic? It's called a Sawzall. You're welcome. <sighs> Anyway, maybe I messed up enough stuff that you learned in your first two years of electrical engineering school to give Electro Boom material to do his own video, and maybe he'll finally, I don't know, make a functioning taser out of a cell phone battery or something? Man, I hope no one floods his inbox asking for a cell phone taser that runs off your cell phone battery. That'd be horrible. Sincerely, Austin. Awesome.